Hi everybody, welcome to our video on the energy budget of rivers. In the last video, we talked about watersheds and the water cycle and discharge, kind of gave an overview of how rivers work. And in this video, we're gonna dive into the nitty gritty and look at some of the physics that control how rivers behave. So in this video, we're gonna first frame this problem of a river's energy budget in terms of uh, flooding in New England. And then in the second part of the video, we're gonna look at how the energy balance of a river is a balance between driving forces and resisting forces. And together, those determine the velocity of water in a river channel. And then in the final part of the video, we're gonna look at a couple of handy equations that let hydrologists compute the velocity of water in a river channel or the largest class size that that channel might carry. So fasten your seatbelts for a little bit of physics and engineering hydrology here. But first, the problem. Here's an example. In August of 2011, Vermont and New England experienced huge flooding in the aftermath of Hurricane Irene. And the energy budgets of rivers came into play in two different ways. First, on the front end of the flooding, rivers that had excess energy eroded rock and moved a lot of sediment. And that creates obvious problems as that erosion destroys roads and homes and other infrastructure. But on the back side of the flooding, as the floodwaters receded, those rivers that had been raging torrents carrying huge clasts and boulders subsided and they were no longer able to carry those coarse cobbles and clasts and they essentially filled the river channels with boulders and so in the days and weeks after the floods people started to realize wow there's essentially no river channel left it's been entirely filled up with boulders and cobbles so it's a logical question. Well, what's gonna happen during the next storm event? Where is that water gonna go if there's no longer a river channel to actually carry the water? Of course, it's gonna flood sooner. There's no space for the water, so that water would just flood out over the channel bank and cause further flooding and damage. So local towns and road crews did the logical thing they went ahead and removed that coarse clastic material from the channel, essentially dredged a new channel. But this created a lot of conflict in Vermont because on the one hand, We know that this channel sedimentation is part of a river's natural adjustment process. But on the other hand, we know we don't want immediate flooding during the next storm event. So this raises a question. Will the river naturally move these sediments and scour out a new channel for itself? Or should we actually be dredging these channels in the aftermath of a flood? And we can recast this question and ask, a more direct question, which is, will the river flow fast enough to move these cobbles out of the channel before it has so much water that it goes over its banks? So there's essentially a, comp a competition. Can it move these cobbles before it floods over its banks? And to answer a question like that, we need to understand the physics of how rivers work and their energy budgets. So that brings us to the energy balance of rivers. And when we think about energy balance, we think of it in terms of driving and resisting forces that combine to determine the water velocity. So on the driving side, we have the slope of the river that's accelerating the water downhill, okay? And creating energy. On the resisting side, we have two main resisting forces. We have friction, like this water crashing along the rocks that acts to slow the water down. And we also have sediment transport, 
as the water carries these clasts through its channel, that takes energy and it, it acts as a resisting force to reduce the velocity of the water. So let's break these out one by one. So the driving force of channel slope. Intuitively, we know this is true. Channels with really high slopes accelerate the water really fast. For example, like down a waterfall. Channels with really low slopes, like the Mississippi River, act almost like lakes. The water flows very slowly because it's not feeling the acceleration of gravity very much. So thinking about this in terms of semi-quantitative physics, essentially what's happening is gravitational acceleration is always pulling straight down. And we can break that gravitational acceleration or that force into two components, a component that's parallel to the river channel and a component that's perpendicular to the river channel. Okay? Steeper river channels essentially magnify this parallel component. The steeper the channel is, the bigger this component of parallel gravitational acceleration is. Likewise, if river channels are very flat, um, essentially all of the gravitational acceleration is perpendicular uh, to the channel, and it doesn't act to accelerate the water. So steeper channels harness gravity more effectively, and they accelerate their water faster. They have a bigger driving force. All right, now let's look at those resisting forces. So our first resisting force is friction along the channel edge. Okay, And so this is a hypothetical cartoon of a channel. Uh, this is water flowing down it. And essentially what we have is as that water flows against the rough edge of the channel, we have what's called turbulent flow. The water is disturbed. It gets chaotic and it gets slowed down in turbulent flow. However, as you go out into the uh, middle of the channel where the water is deeper, you're further away from the channel edge. And so the water's behaving in a more laminar flow fashion and it tends to accelerate and go faster. So usually the fastest water in a river channel is right in the center, um, furthest away from the channel edges where that friction is acting to slow the, the water down. And so hydrologists quantify the effect of friction using a term called the hydraulic radius. And essentially what this is, um, it is the ratio of the area, or the cross-sectional area of the channel, divided by the wetted perimeter. Okay, so cross-sectional area is literally uh, depth times width. So this channel would have a cross-sectional area of 10. And wetted perimeter is simply the summed distance along the channel that is covered by water. So this channel would have a wetted perimeter of 1 plus 10 plus 1 equals 12. Okay, And you take the ratio, which is the hydraulic radius, 0.83. So the, the, the take home point here is this. Wide, shallow rivers essentially have a lot of surface area and therefore a lot of friction. And so they tend to flow slower. Narrower, deeper channels have less surface area um, per cross-sectional area. And so they tend to feel friction less and the water tends to flow faster. So high hydraulic radius means faster velocity, all else being equal. Low hydraulic radius means slower velocity, all else being equal. Essentially, hydraulic radius is very analogous to a pipe. If you have a bigger pipe with a bigger radius, you can flush water through it faster. Now, the other factor that determines the importance of friction is the channel roughness. We just talked about the shape of the channel, but it also matters a lot what the, the edges of that channel are made of. Needless to say, rougher channel beds have a lot more turbulent flow, and the water goes a lot slower for a given hydraulic radius. 
In contrast, things like concrete canals are very smooth. The water will go very fast for a given hydraulic radius. So channel roughness matters a lot in determining friction. So now for that second resisting force, sediment transport. We all know that moving rocks takes a lot of energy, and it's the same for rivers. Moving, whether it's large sediment or whether it's fine sand sediment, it, it consumes energy to move it. And we also know that, in general, moving large boulders takes a little bit more energy. So the largest boulder or grain size a river can move depends on its velocity. And as we just showed, rivers tend to have higher velocity when their water is deeper or when they're having higher discharge flood events. And we typically think of rivers as moving two types of sediment, suspended load and bed load. Suspended load are smaller particles that are able to stay in suspension as the river flows and never really touch the ground. Bed load are larger particles, or clasts, that tend to move along the base of the river by a, essentially a series of jumps called saltation, or by sliding, or by rolling. So suspended load is smaller stuff, bed load is bigger stuff. Now importantly, the size of suspended load or the size of bed load is actually negotiable and depends on how fast the water's moving. So something that's bed load at a low velocity might actually become suspended load during a big violent flood. And here's just a few visual examples. Here's classic suspended load, um, essentially mud in a river that never settles down to the bottom. And here's a great example of bed load, a braided alluvial river, maybe a glacial river, where a lot of this coarse sediment isn't actually moving, and it will move by hopping or rolling at higher, higher water, at higher discharge. OK, so now you know something about energy balance. I want to finish the video by getting back to our original question and showing you how you might actually compute the velocity in a river channel or compute the largest class it can move. So remember our question. Will these post-Irene rivers flow fast enough to move cobbles out of their channel before they overflow their banks? Well, we can break this down into a few sub-questions. How big are the cobbles? What velocity would be required to move them? And can we obtain that velocity, or would obtaining that velocity require too high of a discharge such that the river goes over its banks before the cobble moves. So to answer these questions, we need a couple of estimates. We need to be able to estimate, well, what is the velocity in a given river channel, for example. And we need to also be able to estimate what velocity would be required to move a clast of a given size. So we'll tackle that question first. And I've already said that the maximum class size that a river can move depends on the velocity of the water. This makes a lot of sense. Big floods move big clasts. An extreme example is here. These are huge, human-sized mega boulders that were deposited by the Bonneville outburst flood in Idaho. This is a 1.2 meter boulder. It took a mighty deep fast current to move that puppy. Now if we want to actually predict the exact velocity required to move one of these clasts, we can use something called the Costa equation. This is an empirical relationship that predicts the velocity required to move a clast as a function of its diameter. And this was constructed by hydrologists, a guy named Costa, who went out and literally went to field sites where, right after floods where he knew how fast the water had been moving and he went out and measured the diameter of boulders that he was certain had moved. And he constructed this relationship in which the velocity of the water can be predicted just by measuring the diameter of the clast that was moved.
and we'll be using this in lab later this week. Okay, so we might be able to estimate what velocity it would take to move a clast. Now we need to also estimate, could our channel accommodate that velocity? And so this brings up another empirical equation called the Manning's equation. And this is used uh, to essentially predict the average water velocity in a channel as a function of its channel properties. In this case, a guy named Manning looked at a lot of different rivers and was able to show that velocity depends on the hydraulic radius, which we've already talked about, and is a resisting force, depends on the slope, which is a driving force, and it depends on this term n, which is the roughness. So here we have a mathematical relationship that essentially encapsulates both the driving forces uh, of slope and the resisting forces of friction to compute the velocity in a channel. And this is assuming uh, relatively little sediment transport. And just so you know, the roughness coefficient is typically estimated um, visually. So for example, it might be a large number for a rough mountain stream or a small number for a concrete channel. And in lab, we'll be using both the Costa equation and the Manning equation to make some estimates of past floods on the Middlebury River. So in summary, in this video, you've learned that the evolution of river channels is controlled by their energy budget. And we can think of energy budgets in terms of driving forces, like channel slope, and resisting forces, like friction and sediment transport. We then went further and showed that friction depends on the hydraulic radius, so essentially the, the geometry of the channel, and also the roughness of the channel bed. In terms of the resisting force of sediment transport, we showed that that can happen via suspended load or via bed load. And then we finished the video by showing a way to predict the water velocity required to move a given class size. That was called the Costa equation. And then another relationship that lets us predict the average velocity of water for a given set of channel properties. And that was called the Manning equation. Thanks so much for listening. Take a look at these concept questions and you should be able to answer them. And we'll see you in class.